bienvenidos al Foro Virtual GICEF 2020. El poder de la comunidad y la economía social y solidaria como vía para la transformación a mayores retos, mayor solidaridad. 100 países, 35 sesiones. The greater the solidarity. So we have 23 sessions, three languages, and this is the most important forum for social economy in 2020. This is the fourth plenary session. It is about a new kind of solidarity towards an environmental transformation. We are going to have experts, authorities, academics, and authors, everyone who is involved in social economy around the world together in a virtual platform to reflect about, uh, to reflect upon inclusive and sustainable development. So before we begin the session, we are going to, uh, make you aware of the fact that uh, as you already know there are three available languages right now there is english french and spanish so in your computer you can find the globe icon in the lower part of your screen and select the language that you wish to listen and so on your mobile device such as a smartphone or a tablet you just need to click on the functionalities uh, icon in order to access interpretation we are also going to receive all the questions from participants and at the end of this session we are going to make a question to all of you so that you can all share your insights, your contributions, your opinions. And the question is, how do we transform the present and we build a new future through social and solidarity economy? This question will appear on the chat and then you can all tell us what you think, tell us what your answer is. So where can you follow us throughout this session and tomorrow's session? There is a website, www.gcef2021.org. Please use the hashtag GCEF2021 in all of your digital and social media. Welcome, everyone. In this global virtual forum for a social and solidarity economy, we have called on all of the major stakeholders around the world to share best practices and successful experiences, as well as innovative ideas and solutions to achieve sustainable and inclusive development for everyone. So it is an honor to have your participation. We are going to warmly welcome Secretary from GSEF, the Mexico City government, the Mexican government, through the economy, the Social Economy Committee, and the organizers of this GSEF 2020 forum. Now we are going to play an introductory video, but I would first like to thank you for your collaboration for um, the organization of this forum. We also have an organization for international cooperation. No hay futuro sin transformación ecológica. Of this organization. There is no future without environmental transformation. A better world, a fairer world, and more equal world will only be possible in a green planet, an economy that will allow for conservation and harmonious coexistence with nature. Social and solidarity economy promotes values such as responsibility and cooperation for good coexistence. And we are based on feasible, um, on a feasible strategy from all different contexts. So the economy should not be against the environment. They should coexist happily together. So natural resources must be protected because responsible consumption can also improve um, environmental consequences. We need to include environmental issues in all of the economic pro in the economic process, but not only for economy, but also for life itself. There are many paths that will converge with our values and principles in social and solidarity economy. So it is very important to know them and explore them. We welcome all of you to this session about a new solidarity towards an environmental transformation. In this session, we are going to have a moderator 
for Mexico. It is a great honor to uh, have her here virtually with us. Our moderator is Patsyan Lau. She's Chief of Staff and Policy Advisor at AVPN. And I am going to briefly introduce her and talk about some of her most important achievements. She's very knowledgeable about the public and private sector in the US and Asia, uh, on social finance, um, personal entrepreneurship, philanthropy, philanthropy um, different types of social initiatives. She was president and director of the GB's foundation, and she was also the philanthropy director in Singapore, a very important organization. Right now, she is part of the board at Export, Export Collaborative, Collaborative, and G Asia Foundation, which is a collective finance organization. She is an advisor from a, uh, for a think tank and an entrepreneurial company. She was also a consultant for Johnson & Johnson, where she implemented new strategies in many regions of Asia, Australia, and New Zealand. So in this virtual forum, we invite everyone to carry out uh, a collaborative dialogue about social and solidarity economy. And we are also going to play a new video for you at the end of the plenary session. So now I would like to give the floor to our moderator for this session, session number four, Patient Lau. Thank you very much, Maria, and good morning to all of our friends that have dialed in today. Uh, good evening from where I am in Singapore. It is a great pleasure to be with you. And uh, as a, one of the steering committee members of GSEF, uh, it is an absolute privilege to be here uh, with the esteemed speakers that we have on our panel. Today's plenary, number four, the new solidarity for an ecological transition is a very important topic. And when we talk about this transition, we have to recognize that it is a transition that requires the integration across all parts of the social and environmental impact ecosystem including businesses, investors, governments, social entrepreneurs, nonprofits, and more. It will not be an easy transition, and our success in achieving this transition will depend on acknowledging and leveraging the mutual interconnections between climate, gender, livelihoods, education, and even more. Our experience through the pandemic has shown an even brighter spotlight on these interdependencies. So at a global level, the social and solidarity economy has valuable lessons on how in a context of climate change, the economy does not confront the environment, but can live together in harmony. In ABPN, where I'm from, we see already over 600 organizations across more than 30 markets that want to mobilize more resources for impact in Asia and from their work, we are already seeing intersecting solutions like gender lens climate investment, livelihood programs, integrated with disaster resilience, micro, small and medium enterprises empowered with low carbon solutions, among other examples. And so I'm especially excited and honored today that we will be hearing from experts coming from Latin America, North America, Europe, Africa, and South Asia about their insights in harnessing the policy, civil society, and private sectors to achieve outcomes of solidarity across economic, environmental, and social sectors transitioning to this new ecology. Let me very quickly, and without wasting further time, I'll give, uh, introduce to you who our speakers will be today. We will have with us Ms. Esther Vidal, Director of Services for the Cooperative, Social and Solidarity Economy of the Barcelona City Council. We will also have with us Mr. Raziandai Bariam, 
member of the Interim Council of the Asia Indigenous Youth Platform at the Asia Indigenous People's Pact. We also have with us Mr. Rene Odeb, Professor at the Department of Strategy and Social and Environmental Responsibility, University of Quebec and Montreal. We also have Ms. Anna Karina Quintero, Advisor for the German Society for International Cooperation, GIZ, based in Colombia. We have also Ms. Ramatu Kaso, Advisor for Policy and International Relations to the Secretary General of the United Cities and Governments of Africa. And last but definitely not least, we have Mr. Sebastian Prost, National Coordinator of the Small Grants Program of the Global Environment Facility of UNDP Mexico. So we have a very strong and interesting panel of speakers today and you want to hear from them, not from me. Let me now kick things off by uh, beginning with a round of questions for our esteemed panelists to respond to. We will be seeking their remarks across two rounds of uh, questions and we will then also ask them for some of their global their refle closing reflections uh, at the end of the two rounds. So if I may now begin and seek our speakers to please share with us your views on the first round. I'd like to hear from them, and this is uh, for me personally a very interesting question. Um, what does the social and solidarity economy propose differently for the ecological transformation? And if you could tell us also from your perspective, what lessons will the social and solidarity economy bring to sustainability, particularly in the context of climate change? If I may ask Ms. Esther Vidal to first make your first remarks, and I will introduce the subsequent speakers after Esther. Ms. Vidal, please. Muchas gracias, Patsyan, también al secretariado por la invitación. Patsyan, and thank you for uh, the invitation to participate in this plenary session. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to everyone who is participating in this plenary session. I would like to share a few insights from Barcelona, but I think this subject could uh, be discussed for hours, not only in this forum, but for days on end, because this is a very long path that we need to travel. And it is fundamental, it is essential to talk about this, and we can't um, wait any longer. We need to face this head on. So I would like to share my insights from the mayorship in Barcelona and more precisely in my department for promotion of social and social solidarity economy initiatives. And now we also need to include the challenges of climate change and the necessary ecological and social transformation that represents a very big challenge for our society and for our cities. In this case, our city is located in Southern Europe, and we would like to share that at the beginning of this year, before the pandemic, which, uh, well, of course, make, makes it uh, much more evident that we need to do uh, things immediately, we started promoting a statement for fighting climate change, and we described all of the major challenges that the city was going to face. And so we wanted to get the citizenship and the government and companies involved to carry out actions to face those challenges. So I'll share some of them with you. This statement says that we must work towards a change in the urban model we need to change mobility and infrastructure that exists for transport. Uh, the energy mix also needs to change. We need to change the economic model that is implemented right now. Uh, consumption and waste should also be managed differently. And there should also be a cultural and educational shift. And all of this is based on a few aspects and a few aspects that are closely related to social and solidarity economy. 
So we need to assess how we can meet the needs for common greater good and incorporate several stakeholders, doing it respectfully and always being very respectful to the environment. So how does SSE help address those challenges? There are principles of SSE which govern our practices. Our SSE policies are clearly linked to a shift in the economic model in order to have a more diverse economy. And of course, the government has a big role, but companies need to be more environmentally responsible. And they also have a key role for a social solidarity economy. I am going to share some concrete examples with you. When it comes to changing the mobility and transport model in Barcelona, we are collaborating to uh, build um, a sustainable mobility hub, which is going to be built by the community. And 26 organizations from our city who are committed to sustainable mobility are participating in the creation of this mobility hub. And we are also trying to change the energy mix together with SSC um, partnerships and cooperatives who are launching projects to create self-sufficient and uh, self-sufficient communities uh, where they will consume the energy that they are producing themselves and that leads to autonomy. And we are also highly committed to uh, creating a new consumption model that is increasingly responsible, critical, and that will also make it very clear that we need to be responsible with the environment. So I believe that the private sector companies should be uh, conscious of the limits that we are facing and when it comes to resources in our planet. And we need to innovate and seek solutions and answers for these problems in a collective way that is much more compatible with growth models that will support life and the planet. This new economic model should be uh, leveraging sustainable production systems. And these new companies should also be focusing on the creation of alternative products and services. And that way, this will all be compatible with our sustainability vision. And collaboration is essential with all economic stakeholders. Of course, in the mayorship, we are promoting governance models and public policies that are committed to sustainability. Thank you. Thank you very much, Esther. And I am very happy to hear that you are talking about the role that businesses can play, uh, particularly in, first of all, being aware of the challenges, but also playing a key role in innovating new solutions that will bring us towards sustainable growth. Um, the SSE plays a very big role uh, also to bring different organizations and, and players in the system together in partnership. Uh, to make this happen. Um, let me now invite Mr. Raziande from the Asian Indigenous Youth Platform. If you could share some of your perspective from your part of the world about how the social solidarity economy can be supporting our transition to, into this new ecology differently. Mr. Raziande, if you could please turn on your mic, we'd love to hear from you. Thank you, Patien, and thank you, organizers, for giving me this opportunity to share our concerns and our yeah, lessons from Asia, from the indigenous peoples. Uh, and hi, everyone. So uh, the indigenous peoples engage in, engagement in the climate change policy and advocacy is at different levels. Uh, and we have been articulating that we are not just victims of climate change, but uh, also we are agents of change that could potentially bring solution to combat uh, climate crisis. Uh, our strength is the natural resources that we have been sustainably managing and defending for generations using our knowledge systems. 
the land, territories, and resources of indigenous peoples are home to 80% of the planet's biodiversity and at least 24% of the total carbon stored above ground in the world tropical forest. Uh, however, the Asian indigenous peoples have been facing enormous challenges, threats from large scale mining companies and extractive industries agro like agrobusiness, logging mega dams or monoculture plantations and from protected or conservationist or conservation uh, scientific conservation areas and uh, among others. So the, so the activities and plans driven by profit uh, without free prior and informed consent of the indigenous peoples are not only adversely affecting the foundation to combat climate change uh, or protect biodiversity and enhance sustainable development, but also accelerating intimidations, trumped up charges, forced evictions without fair and adequate compensation and murders of people who are defending their territories on which their livelihood depends. Uh, so the security, therefore the security of collective rights to our land, territories and resources are key for the effective uh, solutions to uh, climate change. This, this message uh, of our, the indigenous people was also supported by the last year special report of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. And uh, securing land rights of indigenous people is one of the cost effective ways to fight with uh, climate change. So for indigenous people, recognition and protection of our rights to land, territories and resources are key to ensure sustainable and effective solutions, not only to combat climate change, but also to deal with uh, many issues, even the most recent uh, challenges of COVID. Uh, and we also have, a, uh, as an example, we have a documentary story on COVID-19 and how one village was able, how one village in Thailand, the indigenous people was able to cope up with it through self-sufficient ways, through uh, ways which are congruent with nature. And so we need a system that allows the indigenous people to prosper, to continue their cultural and traditional economic and social practices and uh, that are set in place instead of giving the steering wheel to the corporates to dictate as is happening today. So in addition, uh, the Paris Agreement also explicitly recommends parties to respect human rights and the rights of indigenous peoples when taking action to address climate change. So uh, finally, there is a need to have the political will among uh, governments in Asia to put the rights of indigenous peoples in the center of their climate and ecological action. So this should be done with the full and effective participation of indigenous peoples in all the policy processes relating to climate change and ecological transformation. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much, Raziande, for that perspective. Certainly there is incredible wisdom from the land um, that we want to make sure we conserve for the uh, sustainable development of so much of our diversity and precious resources. Um, uh, there will be more, I'm sure, that we can hear from you about how we can go about um, preserving and securing these rights. Um, I would like to now shift um, the, the question to Mr. René Audet from Canada. Um, although it is very far away from Asia, but yet I'm sure there are similar challenges also that we're facing in North America. Perhaps you would give us some views about how do you think the social and solidarity economy will uh, propose a different way that we can transition into this new ecology. Renee, if you could turn on your microphone, we'd love to hear from you. Oui, merci beaucoup, Madame Lo, pour uh, cette présentation. Merci aux organisateurs. Muchas gracias por su presentación. Muchas gracias a todos los organizadores. Thank you to all of the organizers. 
It is a great pleasure for me to talk to many people from several different countries about this topic that I am very passionate about. This is ecological transition. This is also part of my research and in my role as researcher, I have always been interested in the ecological transition and in the way that people talk about it, uh, companies, governments, uh, the, the private sector and researchers always talk about the ecological transition, but it's just not the same thing. They don't all have the same concept. There are different visions of ecological uh, transition. So the first step would be to decide what they are trying to say. And I think this could tell us what the specificities are that need to be considered for the ecological transition. In Canada and in North America in general, this transition is considered as some sort of um, technological replacement strategy. So replacing current technologies or replacing current sources of energy. They mostly mean replacing fossil fuels with cleaner sources of energy. This is the prevailing thought, let's say. And let's say that it's the most widely accepted vision uh, of the ecological transition. That's what the government means when they use this concept. When they talk about the green economy, this is all focused on technology. It's very technocentric. So I think uh, they are not considering the social side of it and they are not considering that um, there, there could be a social aspect. In Canada, I think that this discourse about transition is lacking some criticism. It's lacking some critical thinking. Uh, not everyone talks about this transition in the same way, as I said before. And now in Canada with COVID, we're talking about um, this, this green transformation so maybe giving money to enterprises who are using green energy instead of uh, fossil fuels. So we need some uh, broader perspectives. And this is a vision that is used to justify decisions such as the development of natural gas industries and I believe we should instead stop, uh, we should stop using those uh, types of industry. But in contrast, uh, I believe that if we, we, if we incorporate the social aspect of it, there could be more economic diversification and there could be more autonomy and more resilience for communities if the social side is taken into consideration. I think that social solidarity economy should not be based on replacing technologies, but rather including social aspects. The northern countries in America should not be focusing on technology alone and not only on the technical side. More concretely, at the local level, what I have been observing in the citizen projects that I am following in Montreal in all of our neighborhoods, there is a motivation to participate in the ecological transformation. And this is not happening for the reasons that might come to our, to our mind immediately. Uh, you could think that they are concerned or motivated by 
uh, the fight against climate change, uh, and that is why they are participating in this transi tr transition. But based on my research, I have seen that the most important motivation is the development of social networks through these actions. So through uh, the involvement of citizens and the participation of citizens, people are creating social networks. And this is what I have seen in my research. Uh, individualism is increasing uh, in the economy and you can see that in uh, the world of work and in our daily lives but um, I believe that there's a sort of need there's a sort of lack of concrete and real social relationships with people around us and that is why people are engaging in these uh, social solidarity projects and now with this confinement, with this isolation from COVID, it is very important to have contact. And I think that these projects are going to gain much more importance. Uh, but in my opinion, it is this social need that should be at the core of our insights, at the core of our meaning for the ecological transition. And I think that we could perhaps generalize this idea and could apply to many different areas. But to sum up, I think that it, it is important to, um, to, to change our perspective when we talk about ecological transition. We should not only talk about sources of clean energy and technology, but also talk about socialization. Um, I believe that the social and solidarity economy is headed in that direction, and we have uh, heard about that during this session. So that is all that I would like to tell you right now. Thank you. Thank you very much, Renee, and thank you for reminding us that an ecological transition isn't only just about the technical matters related to energy and technology, but really also about the implications to how we as citizens and community participants are building our social networks and our, our lives around um, the ecology that we are in. Um, it's, it's a really interesting in perspective and I'd love to hear some response also from Ms. Ana Karina Quintero, now in Colombia, who would share your perspective as well to this question. Ana Karina, if you could turn on your microphone. Bueno, muy Un saludo muy especial a todos. Muchas gracias. Greetings to everyone and thank you very much for inviting me. For countries like Colombia, social and solidarity economy is a challenge, as is implementing green development economies respectful of the environment. But at the same time, we're lucky that in countries like Colombia, it has been possible to adopt policies that promote developing sustainability criteria that can also contribute to sustainable development. Nowadays, these initiatives are becoming more popular because of consumption trends and because of the changes caused by the pandemic where consumers have understood the importance of finding products with added value that can truly benefit the local communities, the environment. That's why it has become more relevant to create and adopt policies such as the National Green Business Plan, which is a strategy created by the Colombian government to reach all territories of our country and provide technical support to implement an economic, environmental, and social sustainability. In the past, we used to hear a lot about environmental sustainability, but now there's also more focus on social inclusion, social responsibility, the importance of partnerships and collaboration, shared value, creating strategies for participation so that through partnerships together between different organizations, we can take advantage of local products coming from all the diverse regions of Colombia that can also help to develop local communities 
that culturally have sometimes a hard time collaborating or working as a community, but part of those obstacles have been overcome when the focus has been on producing local products and creating local economic opportunities that can lead to the protection of natural resources and have better services that promote local consumption for everyone interested in contributing to local economic growth. So I believe that social and solidarity economy can contribute to a great extent to sustainability and also to fight against climate change because these actions carried out locally can generate value that when you add it all together can lead to transformation in a country and eventually around the world. That's our goal and that's what we have been doing in Colombia. Thank you. Thank you so much, Anna. And, and I think it's great to hear from you about uh, the important role that government policies will play to catalyze this type of uh, uh, effect from the social and solidarity economy as well. Um, very much aligned with what we also heard from Esther in the beginning about the role that um, the, the city government is playing in Barcelona. This is a very uh, interesting perspective that uh, we can come back to because I think now we would also have the opportunity to hear from our uh, our next speaker, Ms. Ramatuka So from the uh, UCLG Africa and her perspective on how the development in um, the cities in Africa are offering different ways that the social and solidarity economy can transition into this new ecology. Ms. Ramatuka, if you could turn on your microphone, please share with us your views. Oui, merci. Yes, of course. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Lowe. And thank you to all the previous panelists that came before me. It's very difficult to come after so many experts who have already discussed valuable points about ecological transition and social and solidarity economy. So I'd like to start by thanking you local governments have participated to discuss the matter of transition. As you know, the activities of the UCLG in Africa have been very important. It's something that we concluded in Marrakesh. We gathered together in Marrakesh to reflect about the transition across the continent, across Africa, both in the urban settings and in rural settings. We're trying to guarantee social and economic development of Africa. I believe that today this is an important meeting because There are important dates to discuss. The first is the year 2008, where the economic crisis made us think that we could change our mind frames about economic development. However, we did not really take advantage of that moment. And now, in 2020, we're facing a pandemic that is leading to economic recession around the world. This pandemic has made it very clear that our current development process has many failures. We were, we've been promised that the post-COVID world will not be as it was before. And we've heard this again and again. We are change agents and the current crisis, health crisis together with the ecological, social and economic crises, have made us think in Africa that local governments have 
not always taken advantage of transitions, but the best way to tackle these problems are through local initiatives, local policies. This ecological transition should make us rethink the way we produce and the way we coexist with our environment. We need to find ways to create new models of governance, both for social and solidarity economy and to guarantee ecological transition. Our old model is focused on economic development, but whenever we talked about governance, the focus was precisely that, on economic growth. But through innovation and creating synergies between local African governments, we believe that that could lead to change and we can contribute to transition. Earlier, it was said that social and solidarity economy can create synergies locally. And that's what we believe as local agents. We believe that through a coalition of different stakeholders is essential to establish new local policies. And that's an important lesson learned as well. It's a very interesting lesson that social and solidarity economy has taught us as well. It's something new, it's a different perspective, and it's interesting because we're all talking about green economy locally, right? And when we talk about green economy, we normally look for social and solidarity economy stakeholders who are the ones that have proven that it is possible to grow through a green economy without contradicting economic development that classical economy has tried to achieve. We can contribute by improving waste management, we can contribute to energy transition, and social and solidarity economy projects have already contributed to that. In sub-Saharan Africa, for instance, we have learned that zone planning can be done well if we consider the importance of ecological transition. In Africa, as you may know, we are also going through a democratic transition. We have many social difficulties such as population density, and that adds pressure when it comes to resource utilization. And the model of development that we propose is challenging precisely because we do want to achieve economic growth, but we want to achieve an ecological translation as well. In Africa, for example, the city of Dakar, there has been a lot of awareness raising. And I believe that if we continue establishing coalitions between all stakeholders of social and solidarity economy, we will be able to create the legal framework framework because I believe that a regulatory framework is essential in order to start creating more public policies and also to make it easier for different stakeholders to collaborate. Social and solidarity economy allows us to mobilize all the different stakeholders and that can lead us to many lessons learned and a lot of information exchange. It can teach us how to work better together. And that's something else we have to learn, that ecological transition can be achieved if we work collectively. We always talk about changes that need to be made individually, but collectively. Changes are also very important. And that, I think, is one of the most important lessons taught to us by social and solidarity economy. Another point I wanted to address is sustainability. I believe that there are important points that we can learn from when we talk about lessons solidarity 
financing is useful at a local territorial level many projects can be funded through solidarity financing we need to take advantage of those mechanisms to be closer to the community and to be able to finance the transition that we want that's also important investing in that transition and finally what have we learned about the existing model that we have in africa we have been we have been developing in a colonial model we have followed that model and now as we look for transitions in terms of governance in terms of local democracy in terms of demographic growth how can we rethink and how can we break away from the old African model, colonial model, and find our new development models. That, I think, we can also learn from social and solidarity economy. And I believe that this model of villages or towns, I don't really like the concept of smart cities, but I think that when cities can consider the importance of protecting the ecology, that can lead to thriving populations. But to do that, more financing is required, more investment, and I think that social and solidarity economy can also help us establish the path for ecological transition. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ramatuka. Your your sharing was very passionate and inspiring. And I particularly like the point about not so much smart cities, but actually cities of social solidarity. Um, and I think the, the point also about the new models of governance and regulatory frameworks is something that we should absolutely explore. Um, there, is, there is a lot to think about in what you've just shared, um, but I think we now come all the way back to Mexico and we'd like to hear now from Mr. Sebastian Proust uh, from UNDP Mexico and your perspective on the social and solidarity economy and uh, what it looks like here in Mexico. Thank you very much. And thank you to all the colleagues who have spoken before me. Thank you to all our viewers as well following this session this morning in Mexico or this afternoon or evening, depending on where you are, to discuss such an important topic, which is how we can achieve environmental transition in the context of social and solidarity economy. I'm Sebastian Proust, and I coordinate a program in Mexico, which is a program of GEF. It's present in 120 countries. And what we do is share donations to cooperatives, to solidarity businesses, to local communities to promote precisely that. Agroecological transitions, energy transitions to promote resilience and any environmental transition that can be achieved to cope with climate change and preserve that biodiversity. So our goal in this global program is to support local communities to achieve that transition. Here in Mexico, as you know very well, there is a strong ecosystem of local communities and cooperatives such as Ejidos, which is a way to have shared governance of land. And what we do is offer donations to them to help them achieve change. I am actually right now in the offices of a cooperative in Queteca Aeropuerto in Quintana Roo. And I think it's a good example of how cooperatives can lead to transition. In this case, these cooperatives, as you can see, recycles bottles. You can see that behind me and they contribute to the ecology like that. But they also promote renewable energy sources. Their goal is, in fact, to foster the adoption of clean energy sources. So solar power, biomass. And I think they are a very good example 
of the importance of cooperatives to achieve transitions, in this case, an energy transition towards a more renewable model. The importance of adopting eco technologies such as solar panels. And to do that, a lot of solidarity is required, a lot of collaboration. First of all, to learn, to adopt new production schemes, but also afterwards to help each other and let me share an example with you. This is one of the projects that we've supported. It's a solar pan. And this solar pan is a way to cook with sunlight. It's simple, it's easy, it's 100% clean. And the adoption of these technologies, we believe, can be done through not a profit-based organization, but through a collective such as the one that I'm in right now, they can promote it because they want to go beyond an energy transition. They focus on solidarity. They work with women, for instance, and supporting their groups, and that helps. Something else that I think has not been mentioned yet is the importance of resilience. Now that we're coping with climate change, here at the Mayan rainforest in the Yucatan Peninsula this year, we were hit by three hurricanes. Well, one hurricane and two tropical storms, to be more precise. And there are local producers that lost all their crops. That's a result of climate change. There's no doubt about that. It's been proven that in our region, hurricanes have become stronger than they were before. So to achieve resilience, to adapt better to changes, what can cooperatives do? We have seen that solidarity is key. If I share an example of another community that had to deal with a flood, after that flood, they started working together. They joined forces. So when they were hit by the flood, instead of them thinking, oh, we need to stop doing our work, in this case, they produced jam, they actually started working together stronger in order to overcome the problem. And I think when we follow that solidarity in every continent, we have seen that that is the way. It is the way to establish dialogue. It is the way to promote change. And finally, I'd like to talk about COVID-19 in Mexico. We saw COVID-19 affect rural communities very significantly. And we saw the local cooperatives have saving schemes they used to have savings funds and even though it was very hard because many people have died in this pandemic we saw a lot of mutual support mutual assistance that helped by sharing resources in a very difficult time where the markets were shut down completely and now they are working very hard to bounce back so i think that in times of crises as other Panelists have said, whether we're talking about climate change, biodiversity degradation, or COVID-19, it is during crises that social fabric becomes even more important, that solidarity becomes even more important, because that is the way to cope with difficulties better, to deal with hardships, whether they are caused by climate change or by anything else. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sebastian. And I, I find it very amazing that even across the world, there are some very common themes that are emerging already from all of your respective introductions. Um, when I think about what we've already discussed and shared about the power of strengthening the resilience of the local community through um, social solidarity, um, uh, economy actors, um, the, the, the benefit that this brings uh, to strengthening the social fabric and allowing building resilience also not only just against natural disasters but against other forms of crisis. Um, you know what Sebastian shared and also what Mr. Raziande shared about the importance of also strengthening the indigenous communities. Um, you know these are all very important parts of localization um, that makes the, the social solidarity economy uh, successful. Um, but it will not work also unless we look at a different way of uh, thinking about ecology transition, as uh, Renee pointed out, that it needs to go broader than the technical 
environmental and um, energy and technology conversation. It also talks about the social and citizen participation opportunities that are emerging from the social and solidarity economy and to be further underscored by the importance of governance and regulatory frameworks that support that. Um, Ramatuka shared how important it is to create this new, new model of governance, um, even among cities. Um, Anna shared how, uh, what an important role government policies play in Colombia to be able to catalyze this. And also Esther, your first example about how the city government, the mayoral office plays a role here to also bring all of these actors together. So a very, very rich round of discussions now uh, with the first set of questions. And I wanted to remind everyone that this topic is so exciting and interesting that we already have 374 participants on Zoom today, listening very closely to what our expert panelists have to share. Um, please continue to share some of the insights from the session today on social media with hashtag GSEF2021. Uh, and you can also see the uh, live broadcast that's available on the website at www.gsef2021.org. Uh, our theme, GSEF Virtual Global Forum, Great Challenges, Greater Solidarity, Power of Community and SSE as a Path for Transformation, which is exactly what our speakers have already introduced in the last uh, 30 to 40 minutes. Um, now, now that we have uncovered what kind of opportunity the social and solidarity economy can bring, I wanted to invite our speakers to hone in a little bit more on what kind of strategic vision particularly you would have for the local economic and social development, um, which we have all, all six of us have already said was very important to strengthen our, our transition into, the into this new ecology. What would be the strategic vision of how you think local economic and social development would look like in your respect in your respective um, localities and regions? Um, I will uh, go to the same order again as the first round and ask Ms. Esther to please again share your perspective from Barcelona. Esther, please. Muchas gracias. Eh, bueno, partiendo de Thank you very much. Well. I will start addressing topics that have already been mentioned. I would like to emphasize that these strategies need to meet three basic criteria, which have been mentioned already. But I think in the first, uh, on the on the first element, we need to talk about uh, community, community and cross-sectional collaboration, uh, different ways of organizing the community and the citizens. And the community should also be at the center of the policies and the actions that are taken. And we need to find new types of governance that will allow us to work for and with this new this new group that has been created in the second place it is important to look for self-sustainable development so first and foremost it is important to meet basic needs so the priority should not need to should not be to generate revenue but rather meet local needs and also being able to do that with local resources. This is a, an endogenous process that will harness the resources available to the community and their territory, which will allow for a more resilient community and social and economical conditions. So the level of independence will be higher and they will rely less on resources from the outside. And of course, there should be an involvement of multiple stakeholders. So the community and the economy for, for this new social economy model, there should be more awareness about their role and their responsibility, which whatever that might be. And then there is the issue of organization uh, in the society. So in Barcelona, throughout 
The last year, we have been promoting a uh, social economy and we built a 10 year strategy to promote SSE in the city of Barcelona. We defined just how important that was going to be for our life in the city in the future. There has been a, a very rich process, a very um, productive process. And so the result of this was a new policy that was promoted and a joint evaluation where the conclusion was that we needed to identify the areas that were more critical and areas in which we should collaborate to prioritize and to join our efforts. So we did that until last September. We concluded that process in September. And just to provide you with one of the highlights, we identified multiple sectors where strategies can be developed to improve social and solidarity and economy. And examples of these sectors are highly connected to ecological transitions, such as transport, mobility, energy, and care services for, for people. And so in the next 10 years, we are going to work uh, with a sectorial perspective, and we are going to promote um, the development of those sectors in social economy responsible and uh, and conscious consumption should also be an element that will allow us to make progress in that regard and if we are not able to incorporate social and solidarity economy in those dimensions uh, the transformation is not going to be possible so uh, on the one hand there's energy and ecology but we need social economy a feminist economy and we need to spearhead that process to adopt innovate and see how our community experiences can change the situation thank you Thank you very much, Esther, and I and I agree with you and affirm the importance of having this type of um, multi-stakeholder co-creation and organization that can lead this movement. Um, I wanted to now ask Raziande because your perspective of the importance of indigenous communities must also inform what you see as a vision of how local economic and social development will occur. Maybe you can share your views, please, Raziande. Your microphone is not on. Yes. Now Thank it is. You. Thank you for the time. Yeah, it's been exciting to hear the different perspective and experience under uh, different actors under uh, the social solidarity economies. And yeah, from the perspective of the indigenous people, I would say that uh, we, the indigenous people, live in resource-rich areas and are forest-dependent. And their socioeconomic and cultural practices are very sustainable and very minimalist and are time proven. And but one of the uh, danger is that our systems, the indigenous systems, are often portrayed as being backward because we are not as consumerists as others or or uh, but even though we are actually benign uh, to nature uh, so what we confront is against the system of you know accumulation by this through dispossession but we we speak up for a system that respects uh, i think the indigenous people is, uh, are an example or a living example of uh, of uh, respect for local rights, you know, and, and they speak up to empower the indigenous uh, communities, local communities. And also we need a system that uh, support them to preserve their cultural practices, their cultural food, and their way and their in their simple ways of production that are very congruent to nature. And um, and and these cultural practices, their cultural food should not be easily captured or by uh, the other profit or uh, corporate interest. Uh, and it is also 
and it is also important to encourage diversity and to Rosiande, I think your yeah. microphone has been turned off. If you could check your microphone, please. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so uh, I was saying that, uh, so we endorse and we speak up for a system that encourages diversity and to instill and also give the support that the indigenous people need and and for their values, for their practices, and also uh, learn from them. And also uh, empowering a local economic and social development is definitely to be fought at various levels, uh, supporting the indigenous people, empowering them to assert their legal rights, and also pressuring governments to protect their rights and supporting and educating the young people about the values of about the values of their culture, their food, their works uh, that they do, and that they sh that it should not be easily or it should not be colonized by the consumerist monopolizing trends that often captures them. Uh, and what we have seen is that the IPs are self-sufficient, as I have given, if I have said before, and their social and economic practices are sustainable. So, um, yeah, to end with, uh, so I want to instill this idea that uh, that the idea and the understanding that we are not just part of nature, but we are nature itself, and to hurt the environment or to harm the environment is to cut our own buddy and yes i think i'll end with that thank you very much rosiande and i i hear you about the importance of uh, supporting and championing the very congruent and indigenous culture uh, practices that are that are already embedded as part of the ecology um, i want to ask now renee to come back to your earlier point about the broader vision of what ecological transition means um, come, you know, just like Raziande, there's this very tight connection between really what it means to be um, living in a new ecology and also the implications and the engagement of social networks and communities. What do you, what to you is this new strategic vision that you think we can see among local economic and social development? Renee, if you could turn oui, on your microphone. Uh, oh, uh, yes, please. Oui, alors, uh, bah, les liens sont très bueno, estas son muy importantes y creo que si queremos eh, reflexionar sobre una visión estratégica para una eh, economía local y el desarrollo social, debemos pensar. We need to think about the role of social innovation uh, in the community. So if we need to broaden that vision and have a broader perspective of uh, transition and how to replace uh, this, this notion that we have right now, I think that there are two elements that must be considered. It must be acknowledged that all realities are different in all corners of the world. There is no uh, miracle solution. There is no magical pill. I think it is very uh, difficult and impossible to to uh, find a universal solution. But there are main major principles that should be acknowledged. I think that the first of them is that this division should be this new uh, classification, this new transition should be based on participation of different stakeholders. Uh, other panelists have used the word endogenous, so an endogenous approach. And I am also a promoter of these uh, endogenous um, approaches in the regions, uh, in the rural areas, in urban areas. So there are more ecological transitions, more than one. So uh, we need to take into consideration the local context so that it can also, the, the initiatives can also work for the people who live there. 
Uh, so it sounds very easy, right? But it's not so. Uh, I believe that the second element is a little bit more controversial. Uh, maybe not all of us will agree about this, but I think that we need more economic planning. Economic planning needs to be a priority. And this is difficult because there are many issues uh, for uh, climatic justice, environmental justice, and this is very important, but uh, I think that we need to be cautious and we need to remember this fact that there is no universal solution, but economic planning is a very important issue that we don't talk much about. The Economic planning is made only by the administration councils and only by uh, the big companies and multinational companies. Um, and I'm referring to planning for resource exploitation and everything that is related to the capacity that the ecosystem has to, um, to reduce the carbon print, for instance. We, we can't keep doing it the way that we are doing right now uh, to destroy all of the resources. So it's a, a little bit contradictory, right? Uh, and when we talk about the endogenous context and then the economic planning, but I believe that the use of, um, of natural resources in a more rational way needs to be planified, that needs to be planned. And we don't have a choice, we need to closely monitor extractive activities, for instance, or the use of natural resources. And this needs to be more democratic, it needs to be more decentralized, but if we don't have any type of democratic planning for the economy, um, it will never be efficient enough. So it is very good to reach a good degree of consensus for planning, and we need to, of course, always be responsible and we need to respect uh, international guidelines about climate and the environment. And the countries that are responsible for the destruction of ecosystems should be responsible for uh, solving all of these issues related to exploitation of resources. But this cannot be approached without thinking about uh, the compensation and how this is going to be done in each of the communities. And so it, it is about um, a, particip a participatory local economy, but on the other hand, we need a little bit more of a centralized planning, but it, it should be democratic and fair. In my country and in some countries, there are no institutions that are really ready for uh, for the insurance of this process. So there are little by little more and more initiatives, but I think that there are no institutions that are ready to take on this uh, ecological transition challenge. And I believe that social and solidarity economy will be very important to move this forward. Thank you. Thank you very much, Renee, for that perspective. And um, it, it, it's interesting because you are talking also, you know, from the perspective that is top down as well as bottom up uh, in, in terms of how we have to not only have a communi communi community and participatory way of, um, of, of looking at how stakeholders are involved, but also a more centralized way of planning that takes into account the various implications uh, to perhaps uh, social and environmental uh, considerations that did not uh, go into traditional economic uh, planning in the past. Um, and that's actually a very good introduction now to uh, my invitation to Anna Karina, given your earlier comment about uh, government policies playing a very big role in catalyzing social and solidarity economy. What are your views then on what this means for the local economic and social development uh, in Colombia? Well, I must say that I couldn't agree more with what Renee said. I think it is extremely important to have a strategic vision that will encompass 
both communities and productive sectors in the decision making and the public sector and the private sector should participate in order to have a clear understanding of what is happening, what the context is, and to be able to prevent or and also uh, project those changes that will come in the future related to either climate change or the consequences that it will bring. And of course, this is also related to the the crop loss that was mentioned before, pandemics and all of these diverse issues. So I do subscribe to that vision. And I would like to add something to that. I think that innovation should be key to look for solutions that will address both uh, environmental problems and social problems. And we need to look for new ways to approach those issues. Maybe we need to be more observant of the environment, of nature, uh, or maybe take a closer look at nature and how nature acts in order for us to replicate some of those processes that are uh, closer to natural processes and that will be benefit the community. We also need to work on cultural issues. For example, in Latin America and Colombia, uh, mainly I can speak for Colombia, um, there are many places where there is no trust that has been built to create associations. There is no trust to do any type of teamwork. So the cultural aspect is very important to be able to build this new strategic vision. And we need to try to foresee all the changes that will take place and look for innovative solutions so that we can do things not in a conventional way, but in a totally different way that will bring uh, benefits to the environment and help us address those environmental challenges. We need to take into consideration the social and economic side of the, of the matter. Thank you. Very much agree with you, Anna Karina, and I think this is this importance of building trust, uh, of having trust before we can build the strategic vision together, um, both uh, at at a, at, a, at a central or national government level, but also I think at a localized community level. And I'd like to invite now Ramatuka, given your work with cities, um, what are, what are your reflections and responses to what you've already heard so far about the strategic vision for the local economy and social development? Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Lowe. When it comes to the strategic vision, I think the territorial collectiveness is very important. So for the African, African cities, we need to work collectively because there is a, a wide array of projects. So we need to go from having many projects to having a single territorial project for our cities in Africa, because now there are no local initiatives. So we need to define one project for a territory. territory. And so we need to identify who the stakes, stakeholders are and a new way to have a different type of governance, which is closely related to what our Canadian uh, colleagues said. There are several types of planning that need, need to happen. But first and foremost, there is strategic planning and afterwards everything else will follow. So it needs to be a hierarchical planning. It doesn't matter if it's top down or bottom up. I think we need to have a joint project for coexistence. So this will be defined both for us and for future generations. This needs to be created in order to promote social and solidarity economy. 
there is another very important principle for the strategic vision, which is local democracy. And we often forget that it is very important for what we are trying to achieve. This has been observed now during the COVID pandemic. Many things that were considered to be democratic achievements have now disappeared due to the healthcare to the health emergency. So, with a new type of governance, the democrat the democracy principle should always be present. And within democratic democracy, we can find a very important element, which is uh, subsidies. So, who does what? Uh, who is better prepared to carry out a project or to carry out a specific action. That is very important for the collective effort. And finally, there is solidarity among territories. This is a local principle. And so it has to do with costs, it, have to, it has to do with the community, but this is also a cross-border issue because we need to collaborate among countries and international regions. There is a lot of migration related to climate change and to the difficulty um, of to access to resources. So this is all related to a non-inclusive type of development. And this will all this will all help us create a strategic vision for a social and solidarity economy at the local level. Thank you so much, Ramatuka. And and I think what you have highlighted also is a very important element of ownership. Um the the, the ownership by local communities in uh, not only just uh, uh, establishing a vision for themselves, but also to jointly own the creation of what this larger um, cross-sector, uh, cross-country or cross-border um, uh, vision could be as well. Um, I'd like to now ask Sebastian, um, you know, coming back to what you mentioned earlier, also about the importance of uh, local communities and strengthening their resilience and, and how they play a role. What do you think um, will be the implications for them about building the strategic vision? for um, the, the way that local communities are developing. Well, thank you very much. Well, I don't really have much time, so I will try to be quick. Um, I think at the strategic level, it is very important to connect the concept of social and solidarity economy to the territory. Sometimes all economic concepts are sep separate. So uh, the territory, the jungle, the sea, the river, the lake. But it's actually more of a symbiotic relationship among all of those elements. So we need to put territory, like indigenous territory, cooperative territory, at the core of the discussion for this transition, mainly when it comes to agricultural or energy transition or maybe the sustainable management of forests. Finally, if we think about that hypothesis of connecting SSC to the territories, well, just uh, a few days ago, it was the Nobel Prize season, and we remembered that in 2009, Emily Rostrom um, received the Nobel Prize for economics um, because of the government governance of common goods. And if you analyze that theory, which was an award-winning theory, um, you will see that the common means e economy uh, is closely related to uh, negotiation, solidarity, setting rules in a, in a joint effort and to have to have collaboration, to have a cooperative. It's basically the same thing. So this we, we use this uh, theoretical and methodological framework quite a lot. Close to where I am, there are cooperatives for fishing. Uh, so there's sustainable fishing and there is comprehensive management. And those cooperatives are not owners of the sea. The Mexican Sea, is owned by the nation. So the cooperative needs to have an authorization to practice fishing, but the more sustainable their practices are, uh, the 
the more easily they will get those authorizations to carry out their economic activities. So we need to think about territory always when we think about this um, ecological transition. And just to conclude, I believe that beyond the strategic vision, there needs to be a very big effort to foresee the consequences of this cooperative work, both in Mexico and around the world. It needs to, to be known because, well, in Mexico, and all of our Latin American friends will know that Mexican soap operas are very famous, but when, when do we talk about cooperatives and soap operas? When do we talk about taking care of the environment or using renewable energy or having proper environmental management practices? It's, it's rarely talked about in the media, uh, but there are things that are already always on the screen. So all of the contrary practices are there, but for sustainable practices, we need more, um, we need a more of a widespread um, knowledge. This is not visible right now, and we are trying to work very hard. We're uh, making the most of forums like this and social media to make this community work visible. Sometimes there are uh, initiatives that have lasted for more than 20, 30, or 1,500 years in the case of indigenous communities. So they need to be well known. Thank you very much, Sebastian. And uh, I particularly would hope that one day we can see these types of messaging on soap operas and, and uh, mass media around the world. Um, we are running out of time, our expert panelists, and I'd like to maybe close our session by asking you to share within a minute each your last thought about um, the question that we have also already posed to the audience. And, um, and I can see already very, very, very busy chats in, in the chat box. Um, your perspective, please, one minute each on how to transform the present and build a better future from the perspective of the SSE. Um, it is in effect asking you to also conclude on what you've already talked about earlier, but let's see how we can leave this last message for everyone within one minute. If I could invite you, please, Esther. Very well, thank you. I'd just like to share three ideas very quickly. I believe that in order to transform the present into a better future from the perspective of social and solidarity economy is that first of all, it's important to assume responsibly our condition as social economic agents. We need to take advantage of our potential and the key role we can play in this transition as a driver of change with solidarity, with generosity, because I believe that there's a lot of effort that needs to be made, a lot of innovation, a lot of community work. And I think that everything that is required can be based on generosity. I also believe that businesses and enterprises in social solidarity economy need to be very strong, especially at the time right now, taking on challenges such as digitalization, such as the specific actions required in every sector to achieve sustainability and to find models of cooperation and scalability that can make it a true option for our citizens acting respectfully and considering the environment as well. And finally, reaching our social majorities. As Sebastian said, I think it's particularly strategic to find a way to reach consumers, to reach the general population and change the model of consumption that we currently have embraced into a more responsible and responsible consumption. I don't know. As a conclusion, I would say that we have great opportunities ahead of us as well. And we've created a strong social fabric as we have seen in throughout the session. Social and solidarity economy has been a reality for a long time. And I think it is here to stay. It's more necessary than ever right now in the current crisis. So it was a pleasure. I feel honored to have spent this panel with all of you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Esther, and very encouraging remarks. 
I'd like to now ask uh, Raziande, you also have one minute, please, for your concluding yeah. comment. Yeah, shortly. Uh, I think uh, we have to assume more responsibility. And I think when we discuss about nature and people, this is often segregated, but I think the discussion has and I think nature and people should always be dealt together. And uh, I think the, the idea of responsibility has to be instilled so that uh, we can come towards this more responsible uh, ecological transformation. And I think that uh, the indigenous people has also been at the forefront in this environmental uh, transformation. And what we, I, I think we, there's a lot to learn from them. and their stories about how to how they have lived in a self-sufficient way and which is congruent with nature and lastly um uh, i think a government must recognize that indigenous people have that are that they are very important partners for conservation and protection of natural resource and this should be done by ensuring their rights to own and co collectively manage their land territories and resources yes thank you Thank you very much, Raziande. I now want to ask Renee also for one minute from you. Closing comments, please. Merci. Thank you. I don't want to summarize everything that I've said because we don't even have time for that, but I have learned many wonderful things in this panel. I am absolutely in agreement with everything that has been said by others in Canada. We have acknowledged the value, we have acknowledged the value of the First Nations and their ability to protect the environment. I have mentioned planning, for instance, earlier, and it's clear that if we do responsible planning of extraction of natural resources, we will have a better future. When we talk about transition, it entails transformation. And it's important to recognize that there are many theories. As I have said, I'm a researcher, so I often look at theories. And there are so many theories of transformation and social change from economy, sociology, political sciences. So as a sociologist, I always try to find a starting point. As I said at the beginning of the panel, for sociology at the very base of the pyramid of all the institutions are precisely social relationships. So that's important relationships between groups of people, I believe that's the starting point. And that's how we should start thinking about transformation. We must reflect on how we build our relationships, not only with each other, but with resources, with the environment. I think that's first and foremost what we need to consider. So, that's it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Rene. I think a lot to be said, and we can't say it in one minute, but I appreciate that you gave those last comments to us. Um, Ana Karina, how about you? Well, I believe that the other speakers and this wonderful discussion have left many things to think about. I don't think there's much more that I could add. But for instance, I had a discussion with Jaime Nava about the importance of thinking of other things that can help to support the strategy. For instance, education. If we want to change and build a better future, it all starts with education, not only educating our children, but educating our society as a whole in many different areas in order to promote solidarity, in order to promote environmental sustainability so that we are resilient to cope with changes that we're facing much better. So I've found this discussion very enriching and uh, I'm very grateful that I was invited to participate. 
Thank you so much, Anna Karina. I will now ask Ramatuka your last comment, please. Also, please, in one minute. Merci. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. I think our discussion has been very rich as well. There are many different perspectives that have been shared uh, regarding collectivity in Africa. I think that there are many implications on management, but above all, we need to establish strong partnerships and establish a close community, sense of community at a local level in order to achieve an economic growth and social development. I believe that solidarity is of the essence, cooperation between different stakeholders, including local stakeholders, including stakeholders across the continent. There are many lessons that need to be shared and it's important to learn from what others have done in terms of collective projects in the territory. That I think is the most important thing to emphasize today. Thank you so much, Ramatuka. And Sebastian, last comment from you as well, please. Thank you for the honor of giving me the last word. I just heard that education is key, and I would agree, but even beyond that, educating our youth and our adult population. In Mexico, there is a program called Jóvenes Construyendo el Futuro, or Youth Creating the Future, in order to give opportunities to the Mexican youth. We have worked very closely with that program to give our young people the opportunity of participating in a social and solidarity business model. And in conclusion, what we're doing here starts with building networks, partnerships. That I think is very important. If we want this economic model to grow, we need to strengthen our networks. We need to strengthen our partnerships. And today, perhaps because of COVID, we have been able to open up new channels of communication remotely. I think we can take advantage of that to promote more partnerships. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sebastian. And I want to again express my thanks to all of our speakers. It was difficult for you to conclude in one minute. It will be also very difficult for me to conclude this panel in one minute. Um, I would like to just quickly mention four very key points that I learned from all of our discussions today as a, as a closing comment to the whole session today. Firstly, that is quite clear, strengthening and empowering local communities, their participation, um, their role in co-creation and cooperation creating partnerships is so critical. The social solidarity economy has been here, but in order for us to properly transition into the new ecology, it is more important that local communities and local ecosystems um, in harmony with nature, in harmony with indigenous um, uh, territories are developed. The second thing that I learned today was that we need to think about ecology as more than just about the traditional environment um, and, and technical definitions. Um, to look at a convergence of not only just environment, but also economic and social outcomes is entirely possible. And we should continue to work towards that, um, which leads to my third learning today, that governance, a new governance model, whether it's at a local level for cities um, or at a central level when it comes to how we plan for our resources and our assets in the near future, um, are so critical for us to be successful here. And last but not least, in order for all of that to happen, we have to make sure that we have the right public messaging, the right outreach and education, um, not only among the youth, but also learning uh, among adults, but also between societies and among each other, um, respecting that there are territories um, that will have their own indigenous um, and uh, local community requirements, but also learning from each other what that means, what kind of strengths that brings to the social and solidarity economy and how we can leverage uh, what social and solidarity economy brings. Um, so to close, social solidarity economy is here to stay, as uh, I think Esther said, um, and we can see so much more lessons that we can, we can learn from the SSE to bring us into the new ecology. 
So I thank you everybody for your attention and thank you for giving me the honor to be the moderator for today's session. I learned a lot. Um, I hope that in 90 minutes, we've been able to make some new connections. I thank you, I thank you for your time and I'd like to pass the microphone now back to Maria de la Luz for the closing. Thank you. Muchísimas gracias. Un agradecimiento. Thank you. Thank you very much to Patsy and Lo. What a wonderful moderator for our plenary session. We had a very interesting session with many talented people who shared expertise and very intelligent thoughts. So thank you to all of our participants in the session. Before introducing the video, I'd like to say a very special thank you to Lawrence Quark for giving all of her talent, leadership, and knowledge to make this event possible. Thank you very much. We had a call for videos in Spanish, English, and French to share ideas of solidarity initiatives and projects of social and solidarity economy that were carried out locally. We will now share one of the videos that was chosen to show us how social and solidarity economy is everywhere, available to everyone around the world. Thank you very much. Go on, Didier. Hello? Hello, good afternoon or good evening, depending on where you are. Good evening for, for myself. I will continue in, in English. Thank you so much for having us here today. We are very glad to be able to give a voice for Mayotte. I am Jamila Hassani. I am the head of regional strategy for social and solidarity economy at the Chamber of Social and Solidarity Economy here in Mayotte. For those of you who don't know us, because usually we talk about the world, but we are, you know, this tiny, tiny island in the Indian Ocean. And we also have a story of social and solidarity economy to tell. And today, this is a great opportunity for us through this video called for an ecological and inclusive transition in Mayotte. It is about a cooperative that we have supported on our island with eight cooperators in order to give another life, you know, to the compressed earth um, brick uh, work because it's a traditional work and we will had the opportunity to make it a modern, to give it another transition, to give it another way of living and to be able to give back dignity to our communities. So thank you again for having us here today. Laurence, I'm seeing you uh, again. Thank you so much, Berenice, for for everything and uh, I guess we can just uh, play the video just right now. Thank you so much. Carbiri har mami somora uze de heli rakojo a heli brikila totol fanyilo azio dikari wono wa hanu za ko fanyilo a rango a 76 komo ruho de rakanda tarenda ra somaj tuzini atasuja maurevani har mo 81 82 Nyumba za beto za leo nyumba za beto zini sitia hari hangu vu hari ma moni na nyumba bebriki za toto zini sitia pabi baridi zina baridi pabi mtamu eshi moni eka mba zija leo ziregeze wa wabu sona faida handa de hoto vagabu hari ma inti deni maizi okama mba hile faida pole kama hile wabu na ukamba risirumia di hari ma shitu ya inti ya tuliri rumia obeka spaka shitu ila omu inti Birsi rumi ya shitu kama ilo harimu inti ya. En voyant l'augmentation des prix de matières premières, notamment le sable en Mayotte, j'ai eu l'idée, j'ai discuté avec mon père, de retravailler cette brique et à l'intégrer. Donc en nombre de 8, on a eu une réunion, on a discuté et est sorti de là l'idée de créer une structure qui pourrait nous apporter sur pas mal de domaines. Tous les vendredis, euh, en gros, on se réunit et on travaille sur le, le projet. Il y a la CRES qui euh, nous accompagne là-dessus, donc il y a le CMA, bien entendu. 
Et là, on attend le concours aussi de la collectivité, parce qu'on aura besoin donc de foncier pour le stockage donc de la terre. Et puis l'idée en fait future de cette coopérative, c'est un de pouvoir en fait connaître, avoir une capacité de production importante pour pouvoir répondre au marché. Ça, c'est une chose. Deuxième chose, c'est d'avoir des sites en fait pour pouvoir en fait recycler la terre. Et au niveau de l'environnement, bon, c'est un impact positif. Et euh, au niveau économique, bah, ça va créer de l'emploi. Et puis au niveau de la, euh, du montage, donc les maçons, il y, y aura de la formation. C'est ça en fait euh, le projet. Mais que ça soit économiquement et socialement viable.